Uh, when Alan asked me a little while ago to share, I was contemplating on what I'd actually share. Um, obviously, I want to make it relevant. Uh, I don't want about me. I want it about God. And a few weeks ago, I hadn't fully decided. I had a couple of options that I thought I was being led to potentially speak about. But I went to a wedding, uh, which is very romantic and loving. But as usual, the bride was a little bit later than what was expected. So, uh, I don't know. I, one of those things is when everyone's there and you're waiting, and you're waiting, uh, what do you do with that time? Uh, do you go for a bit of a wander? I mean, this wedding was at the beach, so went for a bit of a walk down along the beach. Some people could have gone and have a coffee. I don't know. But... Um, that concept led me to today's message. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1 to 13. It might come up there as well. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long way, oh, sorry, a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight the cry came out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, that we have the freedom to come and learn more about you and be transformed. Lord, uh, my prayer today is that this is about you, that it's not about me, that it's about your words. We pray that you would be with us this morning, that you would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit will be here, that you will open our eyes and our ears and that you'll give us an understanding of what you would say to each one of us, that we will be hearers but we'll also be doers of what we hear today Lord help us to put that into practice I pray that any dark forces that are around Lord that they will be banished from this area and that we have the protection of your Holy Spirit here on us today and we just pray this in your name so as we turn and we look at this a parable that again this is Jesus that's talking a parable is obviously an example uh, of something that's relevant and it was relevant to these people at that time. So he was talking about the wedding and the lateness of the groom. The first couple of lines there in verse 21, uh, not in verse 21, in 25 verses 1, is at that time. So when we read at that time, we've got to look at, well, what is that time? It's the same as if you see therefore, you have to look at why is therefore therefore there. So we need to flick back just a little way back to chapter 24. And we're going to read some but not all of chapter 24. What's actually happened is uh, Jesus, for the last time actually, has with his disciples just left the temple. So as we read verse 1 in chapter 24, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to the buildings. So they've just come out and they've looked at, come out from where this temple is, and they're looking at the buildings and the disciples being 
country bumpkins have not really seen Jerusalem and the big city but here they've come out from the temple and they're pretty much marvelling at how big the temple is and how it's been formed um, when we actually look at how big those stones were which aren't standing today but were then those stones were literally the size of container ships so they weren't small stones at all chapter 24 and, ver and chapter 25 is actually what is known as the Olivet Discourse so as we go to verse 2 Jesus says to them do you see all these things he asks I tell you the truth not one stone here will be left on another every one will be thrown down and as they go a bit further away the disciples talk to him it says as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately and said tell us they said when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age so there's three questions there when will this happen so when will this temple and when will this area be destroyed what will be the sign of your coming and what is the sign of the end of the age Jesus doesn't actually give them the answer to that first question as to an exact date but we can look through the history books and we can see at 70 AD uh, the Romans came into Jerusalem under Titus and that temple was destroyed not one stone was left upon another it was destroyed to the ground as we go into verses 4 to 8 Jesus answered so he's answering them the question watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many you will hear of wars and rumors of wars but see to it that you are not alarmed such things must happen and the end is still to come nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom there will be famines and earthquakes in various places all these are the beginning of birth pains So Jesus is actually talking, we might be thinking that's actually talking about now, but he's actually talking about uh, their times and shortly after his death. The writings of Josephus, who was a first century Jewish historian, mentions these things um, occurring. He talks about many earthquakes that would continue to occur at that time and also about famines. We can turn but we won't actually turn to it but you can read in Acts 11 27 and 28 Paul describes of famine throughout the areas that lasted for quite some time there is also mentions in Acts 16 26 of earthquakes when Paul and Silas were in prison as well but these were only beginning of the signs of the end as Jesus says these were the beginning of birth pains or contractions you might say contractions show that birth is closer but it actually doesn't predict the exact time of the birth as we go to verses 9 we can read then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me at that time many will turn away from their faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold but he who stands firm to the end will be saved the persecutions the false prophets and betrayal again this was actually in the apostles times we can read about this through what happens and we know what happens to most of these apostles being uh, beheaded or being stoned and killed you can read further in Jude and also in Second Peter about them talking about many false prophets that came saying that they, it was, they were Jesus returning. From verses 14 and onwards we see the beginning of the end. Many commentators believe that from verses 15 and onwards that those followers of Jesus will be taken in what we call the rapture. And then there'll be seven years of tribulation which will occur when events will be extremely distressing. There are other people that don't believe the rapture occurs then but occurs later. So I'm not 
flagging any, so I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but I would advise everyone to go and read the, these passages because we're not going to read every single verse here. As we turn to verse 29 to 31, Jesus starts talking about the second coming. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. As we go down to verse 36, and I'm going blind, I think I need my glasses. Hey. So it says, no one knows that day or the hour not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So Jesus doesn't even know when he's going to be sent back to return. Down to verses 42 and onwards. What are we meant to be doing? Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day our Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known the time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at a time when you do not expect him. So Jesus is talking about the end times and his return. When he gives this parable, we're analysing what he said there about the end times. And now we look at this parable. To give a little bit more insight as to Jewish weddings and again I'm not the expert I've um, looked at a lot of commentaries over the last two weeks um, and I suppose when I've read this passage before I've just read over it yep okay Jesus is coming back there was some people that didn't accept him they weren't ready and he returned and that's what I gleaned from it but if we actually look at the Jewish culture and Jewish weddings it's largely different than ours Usually the wedding had some sort of parental arrangement between families. There usually was some sort of dowry that was for the bride. But overall the bride had to always agree with the marriage. The espousal or the engagement is announced approximately one year before the actual wedding banquet occurs. And this is actually seen as a legally binding covenant agreement which can only be broken by a certificate of divorce. So if we remember in the beginning when Jesus, before he was born, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. It was they were in this period of that one year before they were actually had their wedding banquet. And he was looking at potentially a certificate of divorce when angels told him what was actually occurring. So then the weird thing happens, not like in our society, the groom leaves the bride and uh, he goes away pretty much for one full year. He goes back to his uh, parents' house and he starts building and he builds a dwelling which is either separate to the house or an addition to that house. When he finishes that dwelling, and he'll know roughly when he thinks he's finishing it, but the father has to inspect that dwelling to see if it's appropriate. It's only when the father in, uh, inspects that dwelling he decides, okay, now we can proceed further. Again, that sort of relates to what potentially is happening now. Yes, we know uh, God has built heaven years ago, but again, Jesus doesn't know the time that he's going to be returning when God decides that this is now, it's finished, heaven is ready, and I'm ready to accept everyone. That is the time that Jesus will return. Additionally, the other thing to know is most Jewish wedding banquets uh, occur in the evening. They never occur during the day. The other interesting thing that happens is finally when the go-ahead is given for the groom, the groom then leaves his house and he goes to get his bride. It's actually him that places the veil on her head. It's not like our weddings where the veil gets lifted and you don't see the bride before. But back then, he would go and get his bride and he would stick the veil on his head. Part of that ritual comes out of back 
when Jake was duped with Rachel and Leah. So from then on, Jewish custom was the uh, groom stuck the veil on the head. He would then hold her hand. His best man would then go out before him and he would announce, here comes the bridegroom. They would then go on a procession in night after dark and would go back to uh, to the wedding banquet. They were led by the bridegroom with his bride and the bridesmaids would follow and all those others that were invited would come back to the house and the banquet would continue for a week. So it wasn't like the bride and groom left straight away and went on their honeymoon. It was a whole week full of family and extras that were invited. Whether you wanted that or not, it lasts for a whole week. The other thing is you were expected to bring a torch or a lamp because obviously you needed to see where you were walking. And if you didn't actually arrive on time with the procession and by the time the wedding banquet started, the door was locked and you were publicly shamed, you may still be accepted, but you were publicly shamed for arriving late. So let's examine the parable. It's pretty simple to see that the bridegroom represents Jesus and his coming or his return. As per Jewish tradition, the bridegroom doesn't actually know until he's informed by his father when the wedding banquet is going to occur. So as we read back in Matthew 24, 36, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Only the father knows that time. As we look further in the parable and in this passage, we see the ten virgins. Some versions refer to them as bridesmaids. Jesus refers to five being wise and five foolish. However, all ten are invited. They all had arrived and were waiting, wanting to attend the banquet. They had their lamps or torches. And as we said above, the procession occurs at night. The wise took extra oil for their lamps and the foolish didn't take any. They were waiting longer than expected and they fell asleep. But at midnight the cry rang out, here comes the bridegroom. They all woke up and trimmed their lamps. So by trimming their lamps, they're either cutting the top of the lamps. There's usually a wick that stands up and you can light that wick and it will burn no matter if you have oil or not. But if you want it to continue to burn, you need oil regardless of what type of oil lamp you have. Without the oil, there is little use for the lamp. The foolish wanted the wise to give them their oil, but the wise also know that they will not have enough for themselves, so they send the foolish off to buy their own. Now you might think, well, if this is happening near midnight, where are they going to get their oil? But quite often, uh, on the day of a wedding, extra services are open overnight because they know there's going to be extra things that need to be provided. Yeah, I don't know if they had a 7-Eleven back then. Some say the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. This relates to the wise who actually had the Holy Spirit living within them. And some regard sending the five foolish in a way harsh, but being prepared for the groom to come was not transferable. The Holy Spirit is not transferable and neither is your tr salvation transferable. You see, the five foolish virgins were professors but not possessors of the Holy Spirit. They were professing with others as if they were ready and they were prepared, but they didn't actually have the Holy Spirit within them. As we turn to verses 10 and 12, we see, but while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived, the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Can you imagine some people's response today? In the end time, people are going to cry out, Lord, Lord. And what response are they going to get? For some people, he's going to say, I don't know you. Can you imagine what some people might say? Some may say, oh, I even went to church nearly every week. I went to prayer meetings. 
I sang songs to you. I even lifted my hand. I gave money to the work. I even went forbid to arise. I got baptized. Come on now, really? You don't know me? But the door will be shut and you will have missed your opportunity. That is the message. One day the door will be closed. 2,000 years ago approximately, Jesus declared he would return. And he said he would leave a helper while he was gone. If we turn to John 14 verses 12 to 17. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever he asks in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you many believers have tried to predict either the rapture or when Jesus is going to return and many Christians scoff at them especially because up until now they've been wrong but at least they were looking for Jesus return how many professing church attending people are looking for Jesus to return? Or are we so preoccupied with just living and coming to church and living day by day that nothing changes? So how should we be actually living while we're waiting for him to return? Let's turn to 1 Peter 3, 8 to 15. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult, but with blessing, because to you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So that's how we should live. But why is there a delay? He delays because he is long-suffering. The Bible says that it's his will that no one should perish but everyone have eternal life obviously that's not going to be the case for everybody but can you imagine if we're wanting Jesus to return people for the last roughly 2,000 years have been wanting Jesus to return what if Jesus returned 12 years ago were you around 12 years ago what were you doing in your life how many people in these last 12 years have actually received Jesus? Some in this church maybe would have been lost if he returned 12 years ago. So the question is, how are we living our lives today? Not just while we're in church, but outside at work and with our families. Jesus again talks about how we should live our life in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Again, some people, I know we can't get to heaven by doing good deeds, but the focus on the good deeds is that that should bring glory to Jesus, not to ourselves. The challenge is, have we lost our saltiness? Are we a shining example of Jesus' character in us, or are we no different than the other person that we work with? John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through me. And in John 3 3, he says, Unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. In Mark 8.33, again Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. If we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, we must die to ourselves and be reborn. And this is what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. So the life we live is now being governed by the Holy Spirit and his direction we are dead to our own desires to our old ways we need to surrender our will and our desires we must look forward and not looking back at our past we must keep our eyes on Jesus his teaching and looking at his return the question we need to ask about this passage is did these foolish five ever really even accept the invitation and the question for us is have we accepted Jesus' invitation or are we toying with the idea? What are you waiting for? Have you made that decision? Are you waiting until you finish school? Are you waiting for the right partner? Are you waiting to get that dream job or are you waiting for when you retire? What will you be doing when either the rapture occurs or Jesus returns? As we read in Matthew again, 24 verses 37 to 41 as it was in the days of Noah so it will be in the coming of the son of man for in the days before the flood people were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away this is how it will be at the coming of the son of man two men will be in the field one will be taken the other left two women women will be grinding at the mill one will be taken and the other will be left will you be left behind what if you knew you would die in two weeks or that Jesus was returning in two weeks how differently would you decide to live those two weeks the crazy thing is if we profess to be walking with Jesus and have turned from wrong then Jesus is with us 24 7 through the Holy Spirit living in us he sees all that we're doing anyway we always have a choice when it comes to temptation because that's what it is it's temptation we have a choice whether to follow it or not as a little girl in Sunday school said to her teacher if the devil knocks at my door to tempt me I just send Jesus to answer the door how simplistic are you going to spend eternity with the king of kings can you imagine what it's going to be like one day just to see his face what is the look on his face going to be look maybe you've got two years to live maybe you've got ten years I don't know but are you fully prepared are you watching are you ready and are you waiting these five foolish virgins weren't prepared each of us must make the decision. We either accept him or reject him. We can't sit on the fence because the devil owns a fence. Too many people procrastinate with this decision. As the story goes, Satan was talking to his demons and he said, how can we stop people coming to Jesus? And the first demon said, oh, look, I've, I've got it. We just need to convince people that there's no God. And Satan says, well, that's, that's pretty good, but people are going to look out at the world and at creation and they're going to marvel at that creation and some of them are still going to believe that 
it was created by somebody and they're going to believe in God. So, look, that's not bad. The second demon says, look, we've, I've just got to, we've just got to convince people that there's no hell. And again, Satan said, look, that's pretty good. I think we're on a partial winner there, but there's a lot of evil in the world brought by us, but people know that some of that evil is going to be punished. They know people go to jail and some people know that there's going to be an end. So, look, I don't think that's it. And then a third demon said, look, I've got it. Yet whilst we can help people believe there's no God and that there's no hell, all we need to do is convince them that there's no hurry. And Satan turned to him and said, that's it. Go and spread that message. That is where we will win. Don't play with the invitation you have. If you haven't responded to the invitation to follow Jesus, you can change that today and be assured that you are going to live with him for eternity. For those of us who have made that decision to follow Jesus, is there evidence in our lives of that? How have you grown in this last year in your relationship to Jesus? Are we closer in our relationship with him today than ever before? And if we haven't, then why not? What has happened? Have we let our hearts grow cold? Have we let things into our lives that are creating a barrier between God and us? Are we determined to fully repent and turn from our past and fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith and not be like Lot's wife who turned back and looked at what was she was leaving behind and we know what happened to her. Jesus has such a better plan for our life and although it may not all be a bed of roses, the end will be living with him for all eternity. So what is our response to this? There's three points to finish on. Firstly, we must be watchful. Think of how many times as we read through the New Testament that the apostles talk about our king's return. How often is it on your mind that Jesus is returning? Secondly, we must be prayerful. We must stay close to God in prayer. We must stay awake and pray doesn't mean 24-7 we need to pray. But through prayer we will have strength for all things which will come on us, whether these are big or small. As we read just a little bit further over in Matthew 26, 36-45. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, who were James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Because the spirit is willing but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? He left Peter, James and John to go ahead and pray. But we must be prayerful and watchful so that we don't enter into temptation that comes before us. And the third and final point is we must be faithful. If we flick back one chapter, which we haven't read here yet, but Alan's preached about this in the last few weeks and we're not going to read it all, but in Matthew 25, 14 to 30, we have the parable of the talents. After a long time, the master returns to settle the records of the accounts that he'd given people. 
and we hear him say well done good and faithful servant what will our response be and what will his response to us be when he returns what will he we have done with the time we have been gifted with on this earth we may say look I didn't get as many gifts as other people but the whole point of that parable isn't about how many gifts you're given it's what are you doing with what you've got remember as we read in Matthew 27 no not 27 let's try 7 uh, verses 21 to 23 Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What will you hear when you stand before the Lord? We can be assured of his response if we are walking in his ways and engaging with him in a daily relationship. For those of us who have made that decision, then let us continue to determine in our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit that we will continue to run the race that's before us until whatever capacity we see Jesus. We must be watchful, prayerful and faithful. Uh, let's close in prayer dear Lord we thank you for your word and we thank you for the truth that is in it we know that you very firmly talk several times and say to the apostles that you will return and that we will give an answer to you for what we've done Lord in our lives we thank you that you did die on the cross and that you rose from the dead and you made a way that we can have a relationship with you. And we thank you for that. We just pray, Lord, that you will move in our lives today and through the oncoming weeks and months, Lord, that you will burn into us a desire to follow you that we will look for your return that we will be a witness that we will have salt in our lives and that we will be able to affect those that are around us Lord and we just thank you for that and for this today Amen Excellent, thank you Brendan, let's give him a hand Hey, what, 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 what a great challenge. We're going to go now. We've got tea and coffee uh, next door. Uh, can I just encourage you, though, if, if there's something that Brendan shared today that's sort of uh, touched your heart or, or you've got some questions or whatever, would you go and grab him? Please don't walk out of here today. Sometimes those butterflies in the belly, that thought, that idea, that thing, can be gone speaking to you and he wants to uh, answer a question or show you something, take you on the next step of your journey. Um, great challenge, Brendan. I really uh, got a lot out of that and I'm asking myself that question now. Am I living as if he's actually going to come back tomorrow or the next week am I living in preparation for him to actually come back or am I just living a life as if hey I can just take my time and when the time comes I'll try to spruce myself up and get ready in that moment but as Brendan said we don't know when that moment is is going to be so am I living I'm challenged with that thought at the moment am I living my life with an expectation that he's going to come back how many of you know when you're living with an expectation of something to happen you act differently than what you would if you weren't expecting something anyone else like that like last night, I was expecting my kids to come around to my house uh, to have a barbecue with me. So I went out in the cold night air and put wood in the fire pit and lit the fire pit and dusted off an old table and did a whole bunch of things in preparation for them to come. But if they weren't coming, I certainly wouldn't have done any of that stuff. So we do. We live differently when we're in preparation of something we're expecting. So what a great challenge. I'll, I'll be thinking about that for the rest of the day. So bless you guys.